Hi, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces, alumni, current students. Thank you all for being here. You know, I'm very reminiscent of the early days seeing Haytham and <coughs> Sergey from the first class and a number of our community supporters, Jimmy, Joanne Starr. Uh, it's good to see Joanne from, from the early days of Radio. Of course, Bob and Ernest and everybody. Thank you for being here. And it really made me nostalgic about that November 2003 when I first interviewed at Rady. You know, what a great environment we have here, not only just the natural climate, but also we are surrounded by this very fertile science and technology ecosystem that is just pumping out inventions and discoveries at a breakneck pace. It's really quite amazing. In fact, a number of things that can extend our lifespan, keep, you know, keep us healthy for a long, long time, is all coming out as we speak in the Stem Cell Institute right across from us and other labs around us. But there is a little bit of a problem. There is a last mile problem, which is what I want to talk to you about. Too many of these inventions and discoveries that are coming out of these labs either do not see the light of the day or just take way too long to have widespread impact. There is a huge chasm to cross. Okay, and why does this happen and what can we do about this? So that is what our research program has been focused on. To make this more vivid, let us consider a less glamorous technology that we all pretty much take for granted. So this is the airbags that we pretty much don't think about when we drive our cars these days and that have become standard in cars since the mid 1990s. But did you know when the first airbags were actually invented? They were invented more than 45 to 50 years before that in 1950. So it took 45 years for such a life-saving invention like airbag to really reach mainstream adoption and mainstream impact. Why does this happen? Of course, you would say, yes, indeed, there are a lot of things to work out the airbag fabric, making sure it is safe to be used in products. And that takes time, indeed. But the first of these airbags make their way into the Mercedes S-Class vehicle in 1980, and it takes another 15 years for it to reach mainstream markets, more widespread adoption. All along, these 15 years, how many lives could have been saved if only it had reached widespread adoption? Why does it take so long? And indeed, as we are here, there are these technologies that can reverse aging if only we could access that faster. So that's what we have been looking at in our research program. And what is the reason why this happens? There are indeed certain business bottlenecks, if we can call them that, some incentive issues, some frictions that actually cause these delays. Much like the movies that we all enjoy, we know that they first start in high-end theaters and then they go to budget theaters and then eventually go to cable TV and then finally free TV, right? Some of these technologies also traverse a trickle-down path. They start in the high-end products and once that market skimming has happened, the high-end has been taken out, they go to the middle end of the market and then eventually it reaches the mass market. This may be okay with movies, but for technologies that have human health improvement potential or environment health improvement potential, we are squandering a major opportunity here. And that's what we are going to look at, like how do we really solve this problem? How do we make sure this last, last minute problem is solved and these technologies can be more impactful and more inclusive by going faster for widespread adoption? And this is particularly salient because we are in the middle of an environment where both the environmental health and human health are at risk, right? On the left is a famous graph, the Keeling Curve from UCSD Scripps Institute of Oceanography that shows the relentless rise in CO2 levels around the planet. It, not, none of this is news to you, right? On the right, we have the healthcare crisis, human health crisis, juxtapose it with the environmental health crisis, 
where people don't have access to good health care in an affordable manner, right? If you go to the emergency room, there is hallway medicine, right? It's so crowded, right? And it's not up to the mark, okay? So we need to solve this problem of getting inventions to go faster to become innovations as much as possible. So in our research, we've been looking at why does this happen? What are the challenges that we face? Number one, it's not a surprise to you, we have legacy processes and cost structures that are a major hindrance, okay? We are used to doing work the same way as we have done over a century ago. You know, we do invent technologies, we do invent new products, but we don't reinvent, we don't innovate our innovation processes themselves, right? So first order of business is to make sure we transform our business processes, our innovation processes, if we can digitize them, that can be a major help. Sure, AI is going to be a big catalyst in this regard. Number two, the disaggregation of value chains and supply chains. Where too many companies are involved in the production process, but it also creates some unique, what are called hold up problems. Where suppliers are second guessing each other. And that results in lower investments in productization and causes delays. And we have to make sure we have the right incentives, gain sharing mechanisms that we've been working on that, may, you know, that relieve some of these holdup problems. Number three is being able to open up this pipeline so that we are not just restricting our innovation to an elite R&D department, but it's open to more and more people outside the R&D department and even outside the enterprise. We are working with pharmaceutical companies like Takeda that are going in and accessing PhD students and postdocs and faculty here at UCSD and other universities so they're able to get ideas from everywhere. Of course, this process has to be managed properly. It's a very delicate process because if you don't manage this, what is called crowdsourcing too well, uh, then people don't feel incentivized to contribute, okay? So as I conclude here, you know, we need to make sure that businesses not only maximize their own profit, but they, they're also in a position to contribute to the broader good. Businesses do realize that. This is the new enlightenment. Gone are the days of Milton Friedman that the social responsibility of business is to maximize profit. Today, most business leaders recognize that you can do well by doing good. But business schools can also help businesses not only capture value, but also create new value, much like the rest of the university does, right? And we are doing that. And one way to do that is not only focusing on, you know, opening up this pipeline, improving business processes, innovating the innovation process, but also making this whole issue of inclusion, not just about form, but what I call functional inclusion, where there is diversity of viewpoints, diversity of ideas, diversity of perspectives that actually produce solutions at a much faster pace. Thank you for being here.